Hello and welcome to this session of A Taste of Farming. Today's topic is integrated or intelligent pest management. No matter what you produce or grow, I guarantee you that there are pests associated with it. This session will provide you tools to control these pests so that you can make an integrated and intelligent plan for control. As a Virginia Cooperative Extension agent, I extend research-based knowledge from our two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Please note that this program, as all of our other programs, are open to all. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resource Extension agent housed in Hanover County. My focus is crops and soils, but I'm also known as the Bug Lady. I have a master's degree in entomology and a bachelor's degree in biology, both from Virginia Tech. I became an ag agent in 2012 and my passion is helping others succeed. Therefore, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me in the Hanover Extension office. IPM is an ever evolving plan that includes pest ID, prevention, monitoring, choosing of the different tools or options, action, and evaluation if it worked or if it didn't. IPM is also a sustainable approach that combines appropriate tactics into a single plan to reduce pests and their damage to an acceptable level. Sustainability means that you keep economics, the environment, and social aspects of your farming operation in consideration. Economically, you want to keep in mind the cheapest and most effective and least toxic option for control. Remember, time is money. Environmentally, you need to keep in mind what is the safest for you and the environment. And socially, how are your clients going to react to your practices you put into place? This is why it is important to plan ahead and choose from a variety of control tactics that you have in your toolkit. It is very important that you start with the identification of the pest you're trying to control. There are different types of pests such as diseases, nematodes, insects, arachnids like our spiders, mites, and ticks, weeds, our snails and slugs, and our vertebrates. Diseases or examples of diseases are fungus and bacteria. Nematodes are little microscopic roundworms that can live in the soil or in the plant roots. Insects have six legs, like our Japanese beetle pictured on the right. Arachnids have eight legs, like our two-spotted spider mite pictured on the far right. We have weeds, which are just a plant out of place or unwanted. The snails and slugs and vertebrates have backbones, like our rodents, birds, deer, and other wildlife. As you develop your pest management plan, you need to have the end goal in mind. Are you trying to prevent, suppress, or eradicate? Your end goal is dependent on the type of pest and the current pest population. I am going to use the cedar apple rust fungus and disease as an example for prevention. If you have a cedar or apple tree on your property that you wish to prevent disease on, you can remove any host plants that are susceptible to the fungus within a certain radius. When you are suppressing a pest, you are trying to reduce the population to an acceptable level. We suppress insect populations when trying to control them outdoors. Eradication or complete removal of a pest population is a goal that you may wish to meet, but this goal is often unattainable. If you have an isolated infestation in a controlled environment like a greenhouse, eradication can be achieved. Outdoors where pests can freely move about, eradication is harder if not impossible. When I am providing control recommendations, I keep the following questions in mind. First, is the problem actually caused by a pest? Or is it heat stress? Did I water it enough? Did I water it too much? Is the injury from frost? Have I taken a recent soil sample to make sure the proper nutrients are present for the plant to grow? If you determine the problem is caused by a pest, then you ask yourself two very important questions. 
First, what is the pest? And where did I find it? Or what is the host? If you don't know what the pest is, I would start with asking yourself, what was the host? And if you know what the host is, you can do a quick internet search of pest of boxwoods, for example, but make sure you put in the search box edu, that's e-d-u, to make sure that you get research-based information. Once you have a list of common pests of a plant, that'll give you a good place to start. Once you have identified your pest, you need to ask yourself, is the problem severe enough to warrant the use of one or more of the control options available? Is the time and the cost of control really worth it? Will my profits decrease enough to warrant control? Also, after you have identified your pest, you can determine what is the most vulnerable life stage of that pest. Insects and weeds, for example, are easier to control when they are younger. Another question is what effective, manageable, and affordable control option is available? You can keep records often to help you determine what pest you have and what control options have worked for that pest in the past. So if you have kept a record, just look back and make sure that your records indicate what has and hasn't worked in the past. It is very important that you have proper identification of the pest. That way you can look into the pest life cycle and its habits and its biology. You also need to assess the pest population size and distribution. Through researching the host and the pest biology, you can get a good list of factors that attracted the pest to the site or the host. Then you research the management options and methods available. You need to make sure that you do look at both chemical and non-chemical options. Successful IPM also allows for long-term plans for prevention or suppression of the troublesome pest populations. Let's now get into the different IPM control methods or the different tools in the IPM toolbox. This image from CropWalk lists the different control options. Please note that genetic control is often referred to as host resistance. Also, sanitation is often listed as its own control method. And pheromones, which are listed under behavioral control here, are often included in biological control. I will now walk through these individually. First, let's get into host resistance and genetic control. This is the ability of a plant or animal to resist an attack by a pest. This ability can either be a result of genetic modification or natural host resistance. A host can contain chemicals that repel the pest or prevent it from completing its life cycle. Certain host varieties can be more vigorous or tolerant than other varieties, and this makes them less likely to become damaged. Hosts can also have physical characteristics that make them more difficult to be attacked, such as these hairs on this plant here, pictured here on the top. Or another example, are these hot peppers, which are undesirable to most insect pests. Next, we have biological control, which is when you control a pest using other organisms, such as natural enemies. These can include parasitoids, which are like this little wasp pictured on the right, which it's laying its eggs into the soft body of an aphid. The parasitoids eggs will hatch and will kill the aphid. Also predators, pathogen and weed feeders are an example of living organisms that are natural enemies to some pests. Some microbes, fungus and pathogens can also be used to control pests. One example of this is milky spore, which is a fungus that helps control Japanese beetle. Keep in mind that biological control does not often end in eradication. 
and the degree of control fluctuates because you are working with a living organism to control another living organism. So just like your pest, there are desirable conditions in which a um, natural enemy or biological control agent thrives. So you want to try to make it conducive for the um, natural enemy to survive. All right, on to behavioral control, which is the use of chemicals that don't necessarily kill an organism for control. This would be any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, repelling, or mitigating any pest. The most common way to alter the behavior of an animal pest is through the use of pheromones. Again, pheromones are often listed under an option for biological control. You also have substances or mixtures of substances that are intended to use as plant regulators, a defoliant or a desiccant that makes it dry out. Cultural control is when you alter the environment, condition of a host plant or animal or a behavior to prevent or suppress an infestation of a pest. A great example of this is crop rotation. Certain pests only feed on certain hosts. If you have a pest in a certain location, you should review all of its hosts. Once you remove the injured plant, you select the next plant that goes in the place only if it is not a host of that pest. Next, when you cultivate or till the soil, you are altering the weeds environment, so hopefully they won't grow there. Certain diseases and insects are only present or possible during certain times of the year. You can therefore adjust your planting or harvest time to avoid that pest. Trap crops are a plant that is more desirable to an insect pest than your harvestable crop. The insect will attack the trap crop and hopefully will not attack what you are trying to harvest. You can leave the pest there on the trap crop. You can remove the trap crop plants once the insect is on it and then kill the insects. Or you can spray the trap crop with an insecticide to kill the pest without applying chemicals to your crop. Next, you can adjust the row width, which can work both ways. You can plant things closer together to discourage pest penetration or entry into the field, or you can plant them farther apart to increase air circulation and hopefully prevent diseases. Pruning is a cultural control you can use to help the plant's health so that it can withstand damage from the pest. Fertilizing is also a great tool that it can increase the plant's health to withstand damage. However, sometimes the, present, um, the presence of nutrients can increase a pest population. Mechanical control is when you physically do something to the pest to control it. I often think of squishing a bug or pulling weeds when I think of mechanical control. Other types of mechanical control include traps, screens, barriers, fences, nets, radiation, using electricity, lights, heat, refrigeration, water, and humidity. The control methods highlighted in blue, I would also consider to be cultural control as you are doing something to the environment to control the pest. As an example, to decrease humidity in a greenhouse, you will also decrease your chances of diseases. Sanitation is when you prevent or suppress a pest population by removing the pest itself. You can remove its food source or its shelter. So when you improve cleanliness, an example I always think of is when you are reusing your plant flats for your transplants. You always want to sanitize and clean them so that any disease that was present in the past crop is no longer present Next, you can sanitize by removing a place for the pest to stay. So after you prune out a diseased plant or you prune out any part of the plant, you, you should remove them from the field so that you remove the crop residues or a place for diseases or pests to live. 
You also should decontaminate equipment, animals, or transplants so that you do not pass along pests to another crop. An example of this is when you wash your tractor or your harvesting equipment before moving it to another field so that you don't spread the weed seeds that are present in the current field. The last tool in the IPM toolbox is chemical control. Keep in mind, this tool should only be used when necessary. Now I do realize that chemical control or using a pesticide is often the least time consuming option to control your pest and it may be the cheapest, but please keep in mind what are the risks that you are taking associated with that chemical. You must identify the pest and the most susceptible part of that pest or the most susceptible stage of that pest. So as I discussed earlier, for insects and weeds, it is easier to control them when they are young. You always want to try to use the least toxic chemical first. That way you are exposing yourself and the environment to the least toxic option. Always wear your personal protection equipment, your PPE, and always, always, always read the label. The label is the law, and you need to make sure that you are buying the correct chemical that will control your pest, and that you understand how to apply it and how much to apply. When treating a plant or an animal, make sure that you treat the whole animal or plant to ensure that you get all of the pests that are present on that host. When using chemicals to control your pest, you need to keep in mind the minimum PPE requirements for any pesticide. So for any pesticide or any chemical you're using, you need to at least have long sleeve shirt and long pants on. You need to have closed toed shoes and you need to have gloves. Those are the minimum. But this image here shows you different examples of other PPE that can be required based off the label. So you need to read the label first. Always, always, always. It will tell you what PPE you need. It will tell you how to apply it. It will tell you the pest that it will kill. It will tell you the host that you can spray it on or apply it to. And again, the label is the law and you need to make sure that you're following it so that you keep yourself and the environment and others around you safe. Another point I want to bring up is that USDA organic pesticides or products does not mean that no pesticides were used. It only means that USDA organic pesticides were used. Sometimes organic pesticides can even be more harmful to humans than the conventional or commercial pesticides. So again, be knowledgeable, be intelligent, and use your the best option that is least toxic for all involved. A great reason why we say to use non-chemical IPM tools first is so that we do not have pesticide resistance. Pesticide resistance is when a pest is no longer killed by a pesticide that once worked. I compare pesticide resistance to when an antibiotic is used over and over again and then no longer works. The way that pesticide re uh, resistance takes place is you first use the pesticide and it kills most of the pest. However, when one or more of the pests survive, they reproduce to have offspring that can also survive the pesticide. The more you use the same pesticide, the more likely you will have a pest population that will one day not be killed by that same pesticide. A pest that has multiple generations per year or even multiple generations per month are more likely to become resistant to pesticide. So to prevent resistance, you should practice IPM. Also, you can rotate pesticide families in hopes that the other pesticides will kill any surviving pest from an initial 
treatment. I have discussed the importance of IPM and different tools that are available using IPM. In conclusion, first we want to prevent the pest of the host from even being present. If we do have a pest present, we need to then identify that pest and the population size. Next, we need to learn that pest biology and life cycle so that we can target the most susceptible life stage. We then need to research all management options available and use the least toxic method to provide control. We then develop a plan that prevents future outbreaks and use different control methods to prevent resistance. All right, that concludes the IPM session of A Taste of Farming. If you ever have any questions, I'm Laura Maxine in the Hanover Virginia Cooperative Extension Office. Please feel free to reach out. Have a good day and thank you for all that you do.